Nothing tests your landing skills quite like landing on a short runway. Your ability to judge your approach and touch down accurately on a small portion of the runway is tested on both the private and commercial check rides. First, let's look at what the Airman's certification standards, which are used to judge your performance on the check ride, expect of you in the short field landing. It's a frequent point of confusion where the acceptable portion of the runway to touch down on is, and add to this the stress of performing the maneuver and it's easy to misunderstand. Let's break down what the ACS is preparing you for. Here's the runway. The first area is a displaced threshold. No landings allowed here. On a real short field, we want to try to have our wheels touch down as early as we can to give us the most amount of runway ahead of us to get stopped. That means in the real world, we'd like to touch down at or just a bit beyond the threshold, but not before it, because that would be on the displaced threshold, not allowed. On the check ride, we don't want to make things any less safe than we need to, so rather than have you land as close to the threshold as possible, we're going to simulate that the threshold begins further down the runway. Let's say in this case our simulated runway begins at the beginning of the numbers, 3-3. Three, three. On the check ride, if we touch down before our assigned point in that red zone, it's not unsafe, but in the context of the maneuver, it's considered a fail because we'd have touched down too early. So on the check ride, the earliest we could touch down is this simulated threshold point. Now, the ACS gives us a margin of error where we can touch down a bit beyond the simulated threshold and still pass the maneuver. The length of this error margin depends on whether you're doing the private or commercial check ride. On the private check ride, you need to touch down within 200 feet or on the specified point. Here at College Park, that's an area from the beginning of the numbers to the end of the first runway centerline stripe. On the commercial check ride, the zone is even smaller, only 100 feet, which here is only up to the beginning of that first stripe. This isn't a large margin for error, and it's because on a real short field, a few feet make a large difference. We're trying to get the wheels down as close to the beginning of our simulated runway as possible, and to do that, we need to master our energy management on the approach. What this starts with is choosing an aiming point on the runway. No aircraft will touch down safely at the point it aims for on the runway. Once close to the ground, we'll start a round out to bleed off energy before touchdown. Depending on what aircraft we're in, that round out will carry us beyond our aiming point to our touchdown point. The longer we hold the nose up and float, the further apart the aiming and touchdown points are. The first thing we should do is become familiar with our aircraft's typical float distance. The Cessna has a rather long float due to having a relatively longer wingspan. In a short field landing, there's no need to grease a landing to impress the passengers. We can let that aircraft touch down early and perhaps a bit more abruptly. Remember, those extra feet matter. So once we're familiar with what a good float looks like, we can pick an aiming point which will allow us to carry to the touchdown zone. We'll choose to aim for the tip of the arrow on the displaced threshold. Now that we've established an aiming point, let's think about how to fly the pattern and get set up. We can begin with a normal pattern like we learned, taking off, making left traffic here, and getting onto a downwind leg about half to three quarter mile away from the runway. Now, typically we'd start a descent, a beam the numbers, and aim to make our base turn when the numbers are around 45 degrees behind us. For this maneuver, I would suggest delaying the base turn. Let's go a bit further out on downwind before making that turn to base. The reason for this is because doing so will allow us to line up on final much further out than we would normally. I know the common wisdom is to always keep your airplane in a position to glide to the runway if need be, but we're going to cheat a little on this one. Remember, on a short field landing, we have to be as precise as possible. Having the extra room on final will go a long way towards accomplishing this. So let's pick it up on downwind from the cockpit. We're at a thousand feet. Glancing to the left, we see we're about halfway down the runway. When we get a beam the numbers, where we usually start a descent, we'll continue flying straight and level. We'll delay that descent just a bit since we're extending our downwind. Now, we'll configure as we normally do, bringing in one notch of flaps in the Skyhawk. Let's keep some additional power in to slow the descent for now. Now, we're going to extend beyond the 45 point where we normally turn base. Don't be afraid to extend as much as you need here. If the examiner gets confused, just say you want to give yourself more room to judge your approach. If you're working with a tower and it's busy, you may want to let them know too. Now that we've extended a bit, let's start that turn. Now here's the key. While we're in the base turn, let's start getting set up to be fully configured and on airspeed. We'll bring in the rest of the flaps and slow ourselves down to 55, 60 knots, reference your airplane's short field landing speed. Why do we set this up so early? So that by the time we turn on final, we have one job, to judge our aiming point. 
everything else has been taken care of configuration and airspeed wise. We need to constantly ask ourselves, are we high or low? Are we fast or slow? Our butts should feel like they're moving straight towards the aiming point, that first arrow on the display's threshold. We'll be making fine adjustments to pitch and power to manage both our airspeed and our descent towards that aiming point. As with any landing, we're using rudders to maintain coordination and the extended centerline. The slower than normal airspeed will allow us to cut down on our float so that our aiming point and touchdown point will be closer together. The only thing we should be looking at is the airspeed indicator and our aiming point on the runway, as we continue to ask, high or low, fast or slow. If we're low, we can add power to get some energy back. If we're high, we can perform some S turns or employ the slip. If we're on a good trajectory, we'll maintain our power setting and manage our airspeed with pitch. Once we see that our trajectory will definitely take us to our aiming point, we can reduce power gradually to idle, keeping the nose down until we're above that aiming point, then beginning the round out. We hold the elevator back until we're over the beginning of the numbers when we can allow the aircraft to settle, touching down, and then coming to a complete stop. Seeing this from the side, Notice how our trajectory is taking us to the first arrow on the display's threshold, as if we would hit there if we didn't do anything. But now that we begin a round out, we float a bit, even at that lower airspeed. With the elevator back, we can control where to touch down at now. We'll keep holding it back until the beginning of the numbers are about to come up, when we can relax the back pressure and allow the aircraft to touch down. Even if it's on the rougher side as far as touchdowns go, we're well inside the 100 foot tolerance for commercial. Let's talk about how to get stopped on a short field landing. It's tempting to just slam the brakes like we would in a car to get stopped in the shortest distance possible. The trouble with this is that in an airplane that just landed, there's still a good amount of lift generated by the wings. And this means that the main wheels where the brakes are don't have the full weight of the airplane resting on them. The brakes aren't as effective without all the weight bearing down on the wheels. If we slam the brakes now, there's a good chance they'll lock up, meaning they'll stop spinning and begin to skid and perhaps brake. We want some weight on the main gear first. One thing we can do is bring the flaps all the way up. This will reduce lift and bring more weight on the main wheels. The next thing we can do is bring the elevator fully back. This will raise the nose and distribute more weight towards those two main wheels. Make sure to bring the flaps up before bringing the elevator back. We don't want the aircraft to lift back in the air if we nose up here. Now that we've got some weight on the main gear, apply maximum braking. On the check ride, it might be okay to simulate max braking and just apply normal brakes so as not to wear down the pads too much. So that's how we'll get ourselves stopped in the shortest distance possible on the landing. Let's switch up and talk about another type of precision landing you'll need to master. This one, the power off 180, is only required on the commercial check ride. Like the short field landing, we have a touchdown zone we need to hit. Let's again simulate our runway threshold at the beginning of the numbers. Our touchdown zone is 200 feet here, to the end of the first centerline stripe. Why do we get an extra 100 feet of tolerance on the power off 180 compared with the commercial short field? It's because, as the name suggests, we won't have the benefit of making power adjustments on our approach. Here's what our pattern could look like. Whereas in a normal pattern, with the benefit of power, we can make a rectangular base and final leg, on the power off 180, we'll need to cut these legs shorter. On downwind, we'll run through our pre-landing checklists, and when we're beam the numbers, bring power smoothly back to idle. What we can do right away is start a 45 degree turn as we pitch the aircraft for best glide. This angle allows us to cheat further in than we would be if we were doing an extended downwind at base. And it also gives us a good view of the runway and our aiming point. From the very beginning, we're gonna go through a process of judging our approach, asking higher, low, fast, or slow. This judgment becomes easier the closer we are to being lined up on final as there's fewer variables like our changing sync rate in a turn. So this 45 degree turn we're doing helps get us closer to that final. It's during this time that we wanna judge when to make turns in towards final. Again, the timing of this turn depends on if we're too high, in other words, we should delay our turn, or too low, where we should turn straight for the runway. We won't have a nice long final due to the shorter approach without engine power, but by managing our turn timing, flaps, slips if needed in airspeed, we should be able to bring ourselves to our aiming point and hit the touchdown zone. Here's the procedure from downwind on our Skyhawk. We'll have a look off to the left at our runway and when a beam the numbers, we're gonna bring the power to idle. Right away, we're gonna pitch for best glide, 65 here, and start that 45 degree turn. A 
established on our airspeed, let's drop 10 degrees of flaps here, and we can start stealing glimpses of the runway. Really, our attention should be divided between the airspeed, the horizon in front, and the runway to the left, asking high or low, fast or slow. We should be thinking about when to make our turn, and also when to use more flaps. Knowing your aircraft's glide capabilities is crucial here. It won't look the same as this in a Piper Arrow. In our Skyhawk, we'll start our turn here. We can afford the extra drag from flaps, so we'll put another 10 degrees in. If we judge correctly, we should be able to keep the turn going all the way onto final. If not, we'll want to delay it to lose more altitude. In the turns, we can't see the runway, but we can use ground references that we can see to judge where we are in relation and also to gauge what effect, if any, the wind is having. Get in the habit of looking at the ground in all your landings. Rolling on to final, let's continue judging height. It looks like we have plenty of height to get to our aiming point at that arrow, so let's drop the rest of the flaps. As we approach, we should feel ourselves moving toward that aiming point, just like in the shore field landing. Just like in that landing also, what we'll do is wait until we're 5 or 10 feet off the ground and at that point begin our round out. Holding it until just before the numbers, when we can ease off the back pressure and let the wheels touch, in advance of the end of the first centerline stripe within our tolerance zone. No need to make a quick stop on the power off 180, we can roll out smoothly for a victory lap, having accomplished one of the tougher maneuvers on the commercial check ride. Are landings giving you trouble? You're not alone. That's why Flight Insight has a new course all about perfecting your landings. Just like our popular ground schools, you'll get hours of video tutorials with detailed explanations of concepts and techniques, only this course is specifically focused on making you better at landings. Check it out at flight-insight.com landing.